Dana, thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me today. Mm -hmm. And I'm really happy to be a part of it. I feel honored, actually. So thank you for the invite. Well, you're most welcome. Please let me read a short introduction of you for our global audience members who may not be as familiar with you as they should be. <laughs> Dana Robinson was raised in California and attended University of California, Berkeley during the 60s. That's right. She considers that experience as a pivotal time in helping to shape her life's values. She has since lived in several states in the US, including Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where she and her husband, Jim, began and grew their consulting firm, Partners in Change. The methodologies, methods, and techniques of performance consulting were formed through the extensive client engagements she and her husband had over 30 years. Her many books include Performance Consulting, A Strategic Process to Improve, Measure, and Sustain Organizational Results, Strategic Business Partner, Aligning People Strategies with Business Goals, Training for Impact, How to Link Training to Business Needs and Measure the Results, Moving from Training to Performance, a Practical Guidebook, Zap the Gaps, Targeting Higher Performance and Achieve It. Dana and her husband now call Raleigh, North Carolina home. She lives a semi-retired life. Actually, she's fully retired now at this point. <laughs> but she enjoys travel, volunteer work, and time with friends and family, including seven grandchildren. Dana, before we get into our three key questions, let me begin with this. What do you think of the current state of the L&D profession? And uh, happy to respond to that one with a perspective that I came into the field in the mid 1970s and I exited the field in 2019. So I was in the field almost 50 years and I certainly have seen a huge amount of change, most of it the positive. What I see from that perspective and to me one of the most heartwarming is that the value of investing in talent in people is no longer questioned and when i came into the field that was seen as something that's kind of nice to do and we used to talk about the training budget being the first cut anytime there was a need to make a cut um, that is not the reality anymore our access to the c-suite to leaders um, the budgets it's clear that there's a value placed there and that's important. I think about the early 80s um, when I was uh, coaching a woman who had just accepted a new position as uh, director of training and development in a very large uh, medical company. And I was coaching her and, and one of the things was to start meeting with your senior leaders and learn about the business and the future of the business. So we were in the office of the CEO of this company and she was asking questions that we had developed together that focused on the business, current and future. And within 10 minutes, the CEO stopped her and he said, aren't you from the training department? Why do you need to know about the business? But see, I don't think that would be ever happen anymore. So the value placed on both the development of people and those of us who make that our role, I think is unquestioned. Um, certainly, there is a lot more effective use of technology and it's, it's advanced tremendously. Uh, I'm in awe, really, of what's capable now. Um, but uh, my concerns are that there's still too much focus, and we'll talk more about this guy, too much focus on the process of learning and not enough on the results that come out of it. Um, we are also way too e easy to jump to solutions. I'll speak to that again as well. I still see that as far too prevalent. Um, it's even in our current uh, journalistic media today with what's happening in America on the racial issues and the policing issues. And what do we hear people say? We have to do a better job of training the police as though that's the answer. Uh, so um, that still is a real concern. Well, for me, you know, I, I, I think about the forgetting curve and that's research past and present that 
people do not retain what they've learned if they don't get to put it to use right away. The most recent data I've seen about the forgetting curve is that uh, people will lose about 75% of what they've learned in six days without uh, putting it to use. It's the old use or lose. So when I go to research, uh, you know, I will go back to the greats in the area of, of human systems and uh, human performance improvement. Tom Gilbert, Gary Rumbler, you know, Gary Rumbler's statement of you pit a good performer against a bad system and the system is going to win about every time. That was a statement he made in the 70s, I believe. Uh, and it's still relevant today, unfortunately, because we are not thinking enough about the system in which new skill and capability is coming. So for me, the research that we're not paying attention to is really research of the greats in human performance improvement. I really resonate with the research of Pat McLagan and in her book, Unstoppable You. Uh, the learner, the learner is in control, we are not. Now, there are many things we can do to help motivate learning and inspire learning and ensure that learning actually does occur, uh, but the learner is in control and continuous learning is critical. And so my question is, with all that we know about the learner and the, the fact that they are driving this bus and what we know about the need for continuous learning, why are we not designing more systems to promote, facilitate, and encourage continuous learning? So it is happening all the time, anywhere, uh, whatever we're doing. It becomes just a, a kind of in the DNA of a corporation. So I would look to Pat McLagan's work in that arena and say it's not being listened to enough. Um, an area of research that fascinates me, I will be the first to say I am definitely not that knowledgeable about, is neuroscience. And all that we are learning about how the brain works to help us learn and retain what we learn and are we putting that knowledge into play as we think about the systems and the programs and the processes that we're creating to an advanced capability? And that's a question I have, but I think this whole neuroscience research is a real frontier for us in this field with a lot more to do. Um, technology, certainly, um, we put technology to work in ways that are way beyond my capability, quite frankly, um, from a learning design perspective and maybe a learning delivery perspective. But I don't see a lot about putting technology to work from a reinforcement and feedback perspective. Let me give you an example. Uh, I know of a, a large pizza company that uses AI technology to literally assess pizzas as they're coming out of the oven and determine in the moment if they meet standard. Um, that's immediate feedback, immediate reinforcement. Um, are we, I don't read enough about that. So it seems like our technology focus is too much on the learning input and not enough on the performance output. Uh, there are three that I would comment on. One myth is that skills equal performance. They don't. Skills are an input and performance is the output. And we are still too focused on that input. And, and when the skills have been created, uh, view it as our job is done. One way this is evident to me is we're still not measuring for results. The accountability still is not there as a default. It's being done, but it is not our default. So that is one myth. A second myth is that solutions equal results. If we are putting in place a learning solution of any type, it's as though that is the result, and it is not. Again, it's an input, it is not the result. The result is did people's performance improve or be enhanced 
as evidenced by the way they do their job once they leave or have had the capability developed? Um, and is there any benefit to the organization that can be determined as a result? So again, that's a second myth that solutions are the result, they are not. And the third that I spoke to briefly before is that we, are, we focus on symptoms and not root causes. And so then we jump to a solution training when in fact it's either inappropriate or is my example about what's happening in America today around policing, it's insufficient. There clearly could be a developmental need, but by itself will never change anything. And so uh, this jump to solution that is very something our managers that we partner with may do, but what are we doing to influence them out of that? Um, I, I still see too much of the jump to solution. And I, I really, after almost 50 years, am puzzled why. Um, we know the difference, uh, those of us in the field. And the professionalism of the field, by the way, is one of the things I love uh, that's changed in 50 years. Um, we know uh, what we need to do, and we, we know a lot about how to do it, but we're still not doing enough of ensuring that the investment we make in any form of learning yields an impact and a result to the person on the job, the managers they support, and the organization they work in. It's still not our default. <laughs>